you'll see the very first thing is white balance. You can do this a couple different ways. One would be the eyedropper. So if you hit the eyedropper on the side, you can pick something in your photo that you know is true white and click it. Um, that way it can it gets an idea of, oh, okay, that should be my gauge for white throughout the photo and it'll use AI and technology to get you there. So that's one way to do it. So I just clicked the middle of the cloud because I knew that was white and it was supposed to be white. However, sometimes if your whites are a little bit overexposed, um, it's going to be less likely to pick up the rest of the whites in your photo that aren't as bright as the clouds. So that way it doesn't always work, but it does work sometimes. Another way is to use this drop down menu. It'll default to a custom one, but sorry, it'll default to a setting called as shot. So it'll just basically be the white balance. When you shot the photo, or whoever shot the photo shot it, that's what their white balance is set to. So that's what this looks like in this particular picture. Um, my whole picture is a little bit on the cooler side, but it is, it's not far off from where it needs to be. I can also go to auto. So that is Lightroom's attempt at white balancing it with AI. They, theirs is a little bit warmer than mine. I'd argue that either one is fine. They're both pretty close to true white. Um, and then you can also see these other options that are in here that we'll just scroll through. They've got daylight, cloudy, shade, tungsten, fluorescent, flash, and custom. Um, I find myself not using these very much, but if you're just really struggling with the photo and you're just trying to get there, it's not bad to just kind of sift through these and see if one looks closer to being right than what you currently have. So that was white balance. The next section in this color column is temperature. And there's a slider that ranges from blues to yellows. In video and photos, those two are normally on opposite sides, even though technically blue and orange are crossing each other on the normal color wheel as um, complementary colors. They're considered opposites um, for the purpose of editing photos. So you can see if I drag the slider from the middle area where it started all the way down towards blues, it, to it really just makes the entire photo blue. Um, if you drag them up towards yellows, it just really makes everything super, super warm. Um, if one of those two looks more natural on this photo, it'd be pulling it towards yellows because the building is already kind of like aged and dated. But you never really pull these to either extreme in any situation. You're just using them a little bit normally to get your whites right. Um, you'll be able to begin to spot when white is true white versus when it looks pink or green or yellow or blue. Now that sounds kind of crazy. And when you first start, uh, if you're sitting with a photo editor editing a photo, they would say, oh, your whites look yellow. You're gonna say the white looks like white, but your eye will begin to be trained to where you can spot it. And you'll know if it looks a little bit yellow, you can pull it towards blue to kind of compensate for that. There's essentially the, Tint is essentially the same concept, except on opposite sides of that tint spectrum are greens and pinks. So this is what happens, just always the best way to learn is just to do it to the most extreme version. If I pull it towards pinks, the whole picture really gets pink, pull it towards greens, whole picture gets green. Again, that's not something that you use in extreme doses almost ever. Um, <clears throat> there's times where if you're in a room, lighting can look very yellow and you might have to pull it a lot towards blue to compensate, but those are really just to help balance your picture back out. Um, they're not really intended to use in super extreme amounts on any photo. Just so you can get an example of kind of what that looks like, I'm gonna pick one of these photos, which is a portrait of my friend Savannah, and I'm gonna actually edit that one because there, I did notice there were some greens in that particular photo, um, kind of like the blonde in her hair was skewing green, the background of the wall behind her was skewing a little bit green. You may look at it and say it looks like a white wall and a blonde person, and it does, but when I start to pull towards pinks, you'll notice how much green was really in that picture that maybe your eye didn't notice before. So here's the picture I'm gonna use. You can see I'm looking at our blonde. Blondes are really, ref it's a really reflective hair color and most blondes like to look like actually blonde. So you, blonde's not gonna wanna look more, her hair to look more yellow or green than it actually is, which is fair. So in this particular situation, I can eyeball this and say this looks a little bit green, maybe some yellows and that her hair looks a little bit green. When I start pulling my tint towards pink, you'll begin to realize how much green was there that you didn't even really notice. So let's turn that off and look at it again. 
So I just hold down this eyeball so I can take it back to the original and then pull it back off. You can see her blondes are much truer now and the wall behind her is actually white. Again, this photo isn't actually edited fully so it doesn't have the exposure and the other settings on it that we would normally do to edit the photo. But I just thought it'd be a good one to show you what it looks like when things are skewing a little bit green and how you can use that tint slider to fix it. Then vibrance is the next effect on this particular like color column. Vibrance, if you pull it all the way down, is going to look like a black and white photo for the most part. It's not true black and white. Um, there's still a, some hues in here that aren't particular or that aren't completely on that black or white scale. But if you pull vibrance all the way down, basically just it takes the life out of your picture. Vibrance pulled up more can just kind of accentuate those the colors that you already have in your photo. So you'll see here when the original photo, you probably didn't even really notice that the tops of those buildings have a lot of green to them. When you pull the vibrance up, you'll immediately realize like, oh wow, there's a lot of green hues in the tops of those buildings. It just can bring your photo to life. It's also really easy to overdo it on vibrance, but not nearly as easy to overdo it as it is on saturation. Vibrance, I would say, especially when there's people in the photos, is a much better way to bring life back into people if you don't know how to do those really intricate edits on people and skin tone. Vibrance is a much better way to do it than saturation. A lot of times I'll see people coming in and, or I'll see people upping the saturation on their photo. And that's when you get into Oompa Loompa territory, for lack of a better way to say it. If you see someone and you're like, they're too orange in their picture. Um, it's, it could possibly be that they drug their saturation up too much. So it can really be a useful tool, but it is very easy to overuse it. So just be careful with that one. Same thing with saturation. When you pull it all the way down, it's gonna look close to black and white. And if you pump it all the way up, it's just gonna bring um, a lot of life to those colors. We don't have any people in this picture, so it doesn't do anything too, too crazy. Um, normally I would never be able to bring a picture up to six, a 60 and um, saturation and even be able to look at it without cringing but this is just a building so for architectural photos you have a little bit more leeway on using that. Next you have the color mixer this is one of my favorite tools in Lightroom I use it all the time um, there's going to be another video for this as well just because there are a lot of things that you can do with this particular tool so I'm just going to graze the surface of what you can do with it so if you want to move into that color mixer video once you kind of got the hang of this that would be a really good jumping off point this is a good jumping off point for that um, so much you can do with that and it's just too long to put in this video so we'll make another one for that so what the color mixer defaults to just the color setting, that's the only thing I'm even gonna dabble with right now as you go through this very abbreviated version. What you'll see is that there's all, all of the different colors in the rainbow um, and then an extra or two. And they have, for each one, they have hue, saturation, and luminance. Um, I have the blue selected right now just because that's what the sky is in the photo and that's a huge part of this photo. So I thought it would be easier for you to see an example of how this works using that. The hue is going to take us to either color on each side of blue. So if I pull the hue down, it's going to take me towards teals. And if I pull the, and like an aqua color, if I pull the hue up, it's going to take me more towards that purple pink family. Um, people have used this to change the color of people's clothing. Um, sometimes it works like that, sometimes it doesn't. But for this particular case, if I pulled it towards all the way to the left, you'll see that those blues are going to aqua. This would be a good way to get a photo to look kind of vintagey and retro, is those blues go toward, more towards aquas rather than that true blue. But you can see if I pull it all the way up, they go towards pink and purple because those are the colors on either side of blue in the color wheel. For saturation, if I take saturation all the way down, it basically pulls the blues out of the photo. So there will be no more blues. That's what saturation's doing when you pull it all the way out. You're telling the computer, if you see blue, I want it gone if you pull it all the way down. If you pull it all the way up, it's the exact opposite. It's super, super exaggerating the blues in your photos. For this particular picture, it's pretty cool because the sky being all the way blue um, looks really good. But in some cases, pulling saturation all the way up on any color is gonna look insane. Um, so I'll leave, I will leave some saturation on because I like the way it made the, the picture look. And then luminance is basically you're telling the color how dark or light to be. So if you pull luminance all the way up to the right, like I'm doing here, 
it's basically taking that color and pushing it towards white, for lack of a better word. Um, essentially, it kind of removed the background in my photo because the whole, only color in the background of the photo was the sky, which was blue, besides white. Um, so it just basically looked like it removed the background. It could be useful for something. There's also other ways to remove the background, um, but this is actually a pretty forgiving way in this particular circumstance. If I put the luminances, luminance all the way to the left, it is making my color look um, a lot more dramatic because it is darkening those blues. So my blues started out pretty light um, and then pulling towards luminance makes them super, super dark. All the way down on luminance, you'll start to see there kind of be lines around the edges of things. I really don't think this is a slider that you would particularly pull all the way one way or the other, um, but it's really good for making colors look a little bit more dramatic um, if that's what you're going for. So that's the basics of the color column in Lightroom. I don't want to go into too much more detail than that because I think it's a really good stopping place just to know what they do. Again, the best way to figure out what something does is to put a photo in there and to pull those sliders to the most extreme, all the way up and all the way down. Of course, you're never going to leave it like that for the actual edit, but it's a good way to just know what it does.